So as we get started, we have handed you a syllabus on the way in the door. If you could pull that out for us, we will start off class as all of your students' classes will start, and that is with the review of the syllabus. My name is Katie Gallagher, and I am the Director of Parent Relations here at West Virginia University. Today I'm going to be co-presenting with Sabrina Cave. Sabrina is the Assistant Vice President of Student Affairs Communications and also oversees our Mountaineer Parents Club here at WVU. And today we will be also having a couple of guest speakers from our offices of Accessibility Services, Office of Student Conduct, and Office of Career Services for the class session. Now, as we mentioned, that syllabus, quite important. The syllabus is actually the binding contract between the faculty members and the students in all of our courses here at the university. They're handed out on day one, um, and so all the students have that information on day one to be able to refer to. A couple of key areas that we like to point out are where questions come from parents, and I will mention starting off at the top there, you see the contact information. Your students know who their instructors are day one. We encourage them to meet up with those instructors and definitely ask questions and engage. In a classroom this size, it might be a little daunting um, to do so. You're in G20 Ming Shea Hall right now. This is one of our lecture halls. So if they don't feel comfortable asking a, a question during class, they can come up either after class or they can go and see faculty members during those office hours. You can see those also posted um, on the syllabus there as well. For us, they're a little vague because you all are only here for one day with us today on campus. But for your students, those will be weekly office hours. That's required of all of our faculty members. So it's a great chance to get to interact one-on-one -on -one with those faculty and ask any questions, maybe a follow-up to a test or a quiz, something along those lines. You'll also see the class schedule. Um, today, what we are going to be doing is actually taking you through the next couple months and through that first semester of your students' time here at WVU. With that being said, we will start off with transitioning in June and July. You have a little less than two months, believe it or not, with them at home still. And then settling in starting in August, um, once you bring them back to campus, and then we'll roll through that fall semester until we start looking ahead again in the December time frame, um, looking towards hopefully their next successful semester here at the university. Attendance is another issue where we get a lot of questions from parents. Um, if you look on your pen that we gave you today, there's a 1-800 number on there. And that is the 1-800 parent helpline number. And parents will oftentimes call in, and I'm the live human on the other end that answers that. And one of the questions that we get a lot is, my student's sick, what does he need to do, who does he need to alert, what's the attendance policy? And what we say is, your student needs to refer to the Syllabus, exactly. That's because WVU does not have a main overarching attendance policy, which catches some people off guard. But there's a reason for that. We have some classes that meet once a week. We have some classes that meet five times a week. So you can see how varied those attendance policies would be. We say our attendance policy is the same as yours. We want them there every day, alive, alert, awake, enthusiastic, paying attention. But if they have to miss, they need to, again, refer to the syllabus and pay attention to what that says for each individual course. They also want to make sure that if they do have have absences that are built in on nice sunny days that they might be tempted to take a day off of class. They might need that down the line if they do get sick, so they need to be judicious about how they use those. Just as you all here today, probably on a Monday, ended up having to take a day of vacation perhaps from work and let your boss know in advance, this is your student's job for the next four years. So it's the same kind of process. They need to let the instructor know, find out what they've missed, and get caught back up with them as soon as possible. But make sure again to refer to that syllabus, it is quite important as we do roll through into starting off college classes. Now that transition piece is kind of an interesting one. We always like to ask kind of to get a feel for where folks are coming from here. Um, the A word that is up above here is kind of difficult for some parents to refer to, that adult word. Yes, and you get the nervous chatter and kind of laughter and smiles. How many of you all view your students at this point in time as an adult? Okay. <laughs> So you see why there's the nervous chatter and the laughter. <laughs> we know this. However, we have, as I mentioned, less than two months to get them to that big old adulthood because when they do come to campus, we do view them as adults here on campus. So you all have done a good job, 18 years, pat yourselves on the back, but as they head out the door, we like to think about what are those loose ends that you need to kind of tie up for your students. So how many of you are still the alarm clock parents? Who's shaking them awake in the morning? It's like a support group, you can raise your hands. It's okay, plenty of you on that one. ATM moms and dads, whose hand in the five, the tens, and the twenties? I have one mom with both hands in the back, yes. Got some work to do there. And perhaps the worst offenders, who are the pink shirt parent kids? Who's gonna be still doing laundry until they leave home? 
Yes? Oh. oh gosh. See, these are the ones we worry about, and we have a big hand waver in the back again. It's important, and it's kind of funny, we laugh about it, but these are some of those skills that, guess who's not coming to college this fall? Right? So they need to know how to do these things. And perhaps you say, my son's fine. He's been managing his money since he was 15 and had his first job. That's not going to be an issue. But maybe it's that time management piece. So knowing your students, make yourself a list of those kind of loose ends to tie up with them this summer. Because again, as they do come to campus here this fall, that transition piece is going to be big enough without all of those other little areas as well. I'm going to invite up my colleague, Rebecca Berger, from the Office of Accessibility Services. And she's going to talk about a few other transitional pieces for this summer with her office. Hi. Thank you, Katie. My name is Rebecca Berger. I'm with the Office of Accessibility Services. We're under the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we serve students with disabilities, whether that's a physical disability, a cognitive disability, a sensory disability, mobility disability. We serve students with physical and academic accommodations within their classes. So if your student had an IEP or 504 plan, our office is the office that provides those accommodations. We serve about 1,500 students a year, and we're lucky enough to have a great um, new office on the Evansdale campus. We're across the street from the Medical Center PRT station. So as I said, if they did have an IEP or 504 plan in school, then they're going to want to self-identify. That's the big change that happens from high school to college, is that they have to present to my office. They have to provide documentation of their disability. There might be some steps in, in needing to get uh, some more documentation, which we will assist them with, and then we'll let them know the process of requesting accommodations from their professors every semester. Um, and so you want to uh, let your students know that in, at college it's a very confidential um, situation and um, where they might not have wanted to identify in the past but can definitely use accommodations, then you're going to want to encourage your students to, to present to my office and request services. Things like extra time on a test, priority pre-registration. So any of those accommodations that might have been served in the past or maybe even think towards a medical issue. If your student has diabetes or Crohn's disorder, then they're going to want to present and maybe may be eligible for some accommodations in their classes. So today I'm going to be at the information fair right in the front door as you come in. Um, in your bags are some cards about our office. Um, it shows a map as how to get there and on the back it at the bottom it tells what URL they need to go to to register with my office. So if you have any any questions, please stop by the information fair. I look forward to speaking with you. Thank you. So as we wrap up that transitioning piece, I do hear a lot from parents as we get over that adulthood piece and kind of roll to the next area. That's great, but I what? Pay the bill, right? And we know that. And we do realize that with the transitional piece coming into college, that many parents are involved in that bill pay process. And also, I had a father who told me once, he said, I invest in the stock market. I expect to see a quarterly report. I invest in my son's education. I expect to see some grades. So you can also, through this process that we're going to talk about, see grades, see um, bills, be able to pay bills, et cetera. So well, let me walk you through that briefly. I know you heard from student accounts and financial aid earlier today. The billing process for us here at West Virginia University does fall under that Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA. So all of our communications will be with the student. However, your student has the ability to grant you access as parents through the parent guest portal. This is something that you'll want to probably have them sit down and go over with them this summer and take care of. When the bill comes out, it'll come out July 13th um, for our students for this upcoming fall semester. You might want to make note of that date. And also, if you're planning ahead, the spring date will be also mid-November for the spring classes. Fall payment is due, actually a little different this year, on August 13th. That is the Wednesday before you drop your students back off in camp on campus here in Morgantown. So with that, keep in mind that you have about a month to get that bill paid if you're going to be participating in that process. We will be removing students from classes, and again, this is a little different process this year if you've had students here in the past. We'll be removing students from classes who do not have at least 60% of their bill paid by that Wednesday before classes start. And that effectively is going to open up those classes for other folks who may need those classes. So please make a note to be sure that that process is wrapped up by August 13th. Now, the email will go to your student and say you've had a change to your STAR account, to your um, log on, and, and see what that is, pay any bills that you may need to. If your parents or if your students have actually given you access to the parent guest portal, you will then be able to log on and take care of that for them. 
This, I know you can't see the screenshot very well there on the left-hand side, but that is a screenshot of the vast array of different segments that your student can share with you from their student account, okay? It goes through housing information, financial aid information, student account information, address information, grade information. So all of that can be seen on there, registration, lots of different things. Your students have the ability when they log on to the parent guest portal to check which ones of those they wish to share with you. So again, the conversation to be had this summer with them is if you want that information, please talk through it with them and let them know that. They can set that up for you before you leave. However, I often will get phone calls around the mid-semester point and they'll say, Katie, that parent guest portal just isn't working. And I will say, oh, but the parent guest portal is working. But if you reference bullet number three behind me, your student perhaps may have revoked that access. So as easy as it is for them to grant the access, it is also easy for them to revoke the access. So please make that phone call to your student first. I can't actually, no one at the university can grant that access to you. It has to come from your student again as the adult in the process. But it's a very easy process. It's real time. The other piece that I want to mention is as they sign you up for that parent guest portal, they can also grant you a FERPA passphrase. This is something that they'll set for you. I tell parents, just put it straight into your cell phone so that if you need to call in and call to the financial aid office or student accounts office, you'll designate with that FERPA passphrase and we'll know then that you are who you say you are and we'll be able to discuss with you. So make sure that you again jot that information down, talk over that with it with your students this summer. Um, FERPA also, we do have a few other um, forms, waivers that are around campus. Rebecca, who you just met, her office does have a separate FERPA waiver form for confidentiality's sake. Um, they also deal with some HIPAA forms, so they have a separate form that's not part of this. But the Parent Guest Portal does cover about 95% of the offices that parents typically need to have access to. So make that as a to-do for this summer. Again, another small screenshot, but I want to mention this as we talk about the advising um, portion of what your students are going through and as they will go through for the next several semesters while they're here at the university. DegreeWorks is, if you think back to the checklists that you may have used to kind of track your progress in college back in the day, these are online interactive checklists for students. It allows a much better utility for our students as well to get on and engage. If they're thinking about switching their major perhaps, it allows them to look at a plan B major and shift their classes around and see how far behind that might put them to switch from one major to the next during their junior year. So it gives them a great opportunity to actually get on. The piece, reason why we mention this, however, though, is that your students need to engage in these pieces. And this summer is another nice time to do that. You'll see the little green check marks mean that something has been completed, that they needed a requirement, still needed in red. You can see out there as well. It'll very clearly indicate if they've taken care of something or if they're in progress with it, it'll indicate that as well. So a lot of utility as far as degree works goes. And that advising and scheduling process is what your students are doing right now. This will be the last time that they do that on their, or together, excuse me. Um, but as they go through that process today, they will meet with their advisor and then they'll go over and log on to their STAR account and they'll register for courses. Starting in the fall and here forward, they will actually have a separate academic advising appointment that they'll go in and meet with their academic advisor. And then from that point, they will wait for their STAR registration date and that's when they'll actually then log on and register for their courses. For freshmen, that'll be in November typically for um, the upcoming spring semester. But we have advising appointments that start as early as September. So it's a quite long process. We have about 30,000 students here that we, we go through with advising every semester and they're required to meet with that academic advisor. So you can see again a list of different things that they're doing today. They'll do those in more of a broken up process this fall, meeting with the academic advisor. That active and engaged role in this advising process is something that I can't mention enough though. I was an advisor for four years here at the university and I always used to say advisors do just that, they advise. This is your student's academic career. The students who probably had the best opportunity coming in and meeting with me were the ones who sat down and actually researched some of those courses that they'd like to take in advance. They knew that they wanted to do a study abroad. They knew that they had to have chemistry 116 after chemistry 115. Maybe they needed chemistry 219 after that. They need to engage in that process and look ahead a little bit. It allows them to stay on track and engaged in the process. And if there are any questions, if they utilize these various resources, degree works, um, the online catalog that's available to them, we promise you that they will be quite successful as they go through and transition to their coursework here at WVU. In chapter two, just like that, your students will be settling into campus. Let me ask you, how many of your students are living in residence halls this fall? The majority. Any off-campus commuter students? 
a few of you. Great, well welcome. You know that we have resources for our students that live on and off campus. I'm sure you also heard earlier today that that move-in day is Friday, August 15th, and we want you to come, move your students in, and leave. Oh, this might be the best group. You've been practicing that word. I'm so proud of you. Lots of times we get leave and I say, oh, please practice that word on the way home. And we do laugh about this a little bit because over the next couple of months, it will truly be an emotional roller coaster for many of our parents and your students. There are going to be days this summer that you are going to look at them and you are going to say, I can't wait for classes to begin in Morgantown, West Virginia, right? And there are going to be other days that you are going to look at them and you are going to think, that's my baby, right? Heading to college. And there can be tears and it can be hard for a lot of families, but believe it or not, it can be just as difficult for your students. So we have activities planned for them throughout the entire weekend. Starting on that Friday evening, we have cookouts on both campuses, on Evansdale and on the downtown campus, obviously too, for our commuter students. Saturday and Sunday are filled with activities from First Year Academy to University Welcome. So we do have activities planned for them all weekend. But also as they're settling in lecture halls, as they make that transition from high school to college, this room seats about 350. Probably not a classroom size that they're used to. Also student organizations. You heard we have over 400. We encourage our students to be actively involved. Encourage them to try something new. Maybe in high school they've always been involved in in athletics. This is their opportunity to truly branch out. And well, WVU and student health insurance. You know that student health insurance is a requirement this fall for all of our WVU students. I'm sure you've also heard that we have an amazing student health facility if your student finds themselves sick perhaps this fall or spring. But also know that we have Carew Center for Counseling. And it's a wonderful resource because we have counselors and psychologists available to meet confidentially with with your students. Maybe they're having a little bit of trouble adjusting. Maybe they're not getting along so well with that roommate. Or maybe they're homesick and they certainly didn't think that would happen. So know that we have resources available to them. And also studying abroad. We encourage our students to have that global experience. So don't be surprised if they come home and say to you they want to study abroad for a week, a semester, a summer, we encourage that activity. And also the Student Rec Center. As they're settling in, we want them to be healthy. We want them to be physically active. So we want them to use our state-of-the-art Student Rec Center. And lastly, student employment. Maybe your students aren't thinking about a part-time job, but perhaps you are. So if that's the case, know that we have student employment available to help your students find those part-time jobs as they are settling in. And parents, your environment is going to change as well. As you are settling in, there will be one less person at home, one less person to feed. So we encourage you to join the Mountaineer Parents Club. You were given that sign up on your way in. We only need one sign up per address. It's free to join. Um, it is not PTO. It is not band boosters. Don't cheer too loudly unless you have other children at home. But these clubs do meet and they do plan activities. And one of those first activities are actually summer send-offs. And these are casual, fun picnics, cookouts in your hometowns and in your communities. And we invite all WVU students and all families to attend. So it's a great opportunity, parents, for you to meet other parents of WVU students and for your students, maybe to see some familiar faces, but maybe to make some new friends. Also, fall family weekends, circle that, make that uh, an X in your calendar, if you will. Make your hotel reservations September 26th through the 28th. I always say to students that if they forget to invite their parents back to campus, I've just taken care of that for them. But truly, it is a wonderful weekend on campus when we plan lots of activities for families and students. And your students will want you to be here. They will want to show off their new home to you. Talk about those student organizations, those faculty members that they've met. So make sure you make plans to come back to campus. I always like to ask this question. We're about 20 minutes in. 
How many of you have received text from your student? Tell the truth, because I can see everybody looking at their phones. And you know what's funny is we know what they say, because we've done this for a long time. Where are you? Are you done yet? Should I be taking this class or not? We laugh about this because your students are in constant communication with you, aren't they? Think about when you left home for the first time. Maybe to go to college, maybe to get a job, maybe to get married. How often did you call home? I called home like once a week, checked in, everybody was good, call you back in a week, right? Your students are in constant communication with you. So that is why we want to share the resources with you so that you can help support them. That Parents Club newsletter, our Parents Club helpline, the Parent e-newsletter, and our Facebook page. These all allow us to share information with you because we know your student will text you and call you and tweet you and Facebook you and IM you and email you. We want you to have those resources so that you can point them in the right direction. That's why we ask for your email address on the sign-up form so that we can send you that parent e-newsletter twice a month full of valuable information, not what time the football game starts, although that's very important and I understand that, but certainly when your students should be meeting with their academic advisors, important scholarship and financial aid deadlines, study abroad opportunities, research opportunities. So make sure that you take advantage of all those resources available to you. And chapter three, getting acclimated. I mentioned the transition from high school to college, and it is a transition. There isn't a principal's office anymore. So the academic protocol is a little bit different. We like to share this with you so that again, if your students has any questions, you can point them in the right direction. If they ever have any concerns about any academic matters while they're here, they should always speak with their faculty members first. Above those faculty members, know that we have department chairs. We have a dean of each of our 13 schools and colleges. And then above the dean is our provost office, our highest academic officer. So we like to share that because again, as your students are transitioning, the process is a little bit different. I want to spend some time on the importance of going through college and not just to college. What's going to be the sticking factor? What's going to make your students successful while they're here at West Virginia University? And the first thing that I can tell you is this, they need to go to class. And I know that many of you might be thinking, of course they're going to go to class, right? Every single day. But I want to talk about that difference a little bit. Right now, high school, where well, I'm sure they've all finished, gone through graduation, their whole day was spelled out for them, right? They started at about 7.45 in the morning. They ended at about 2.45, 3 o'clock. It was all spelled out for them. In college, it's not like that. After this session, you will meet up with your student. They will have a schedule in hand, and they might say to you, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I have an 8.30 class, an 11.30 class, and a 2.30 class. I don't have any classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Woohoo! right? What are they going to do with all that time? Think about it. So we encourage you to remind them they need to study regularly. And you're thinking, of course they're going to study regularly, right? How many of you feel as though your students really had to study in high school? We get this every day. There might be five parents that have raised their hands. It's a transition from high school to college. It doesn't mean that your students aren't bright. We know your students are extremely intelligent. That's why they're coming to WVU, and that's why we wanted them. But it's a transition for many of our students. So we need your help with that. Encourage your students to find a place to study. Our students have told us the best place for them to study on campus are our libraries. Encourage your students to find that spot. Maybe they can study in the residence hall room. If they can, great. But encourage them to find that spot because they need to study regularly. Also, tutoring and learning centers. Know that we have academic learning centers on our campus. We pay students who have excelled in certain classes to tutor your students for free. So never let your students say to you, there's no one there to help me, no tutors, nothing, nothing available. Not true. And we laugh a little bit about this because also sometimes parents will say to us, but they're not really struggling. 
That's okay. Maybe they want an A instead of a B. Maybe they want a B instead of a C. Are you okay with straight C's? What are your expectations that you're going to talk to them about? If you are, I can assure you they probably are not going to get into that major that they want here at WVU. So what are those expectations? Encourage them to go to the learning centers. The night before their final exam, probably a little bit too late to try to cram in 15 weeks of work. So encourage them to find them early and often. I think one of the most depressing things that we hear is when a tutor sits in a room and no one comes to see them. So encourage your students to find these learning centers. I also want to remind you the importance of your students meeting their faculty members. That's why they share all of that information on their syllabus, those office hours, email address, phone numbers. Our faculty members love what they do, they love what they teach, and they love meeting your students. So in a classroom this size, a faculty member might not know each and every student's name. So think about this. If your student takes the time to come down after class and introduces themselves, maybe ask a question, that faculty member might say to them, you know what? I'm working on a research project and I need three students to help me. Are you interested? What a valuable opportunity that your student would have missed if they hadn't taken just a few minutes to introduce themselves. So that's very important. And I can assure you that if your students do all of these things, they will be successful while they're here at West Virginia University. And just like that, it's chapter four. And I always say, October is a long month. And so reality sets in for many of our students. And Dr. Melanie Cook from our Office of Student Conduct is here to talk a little bit about that reality. Hi, everybody. Hi. See why I have gray hair? You know where I work, right? <laughs> so, oh, easy on the mic. I'm sorry. I forgot we were being recorded. Sorry, video guy. I'm not used to being on stage, I guess. Uh, how many people out here from a great state of West Virginia? Yay. How many alums? Hey, thanks. Keep writing those checks, huh? <laughs> How about Pennsylvania? That's my home state. Anybody from the Berg, Pittsburgh? Yay. Where are you guys from? What part? Yay. Where, the people behind you are, too. Pardon me? Pleasant Hills. Ah, anybody else from the Berg? I'm a Shaler girl. Anybody from the north? Yeah. Um, how about Ohio? Maryland? New Jersey, New York, including Long Island. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other states, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Virginia. Anybody from the DC area? Yay, we get a lot of, you can tell, this is where a lot of our students come from. Other states I didn't say. Vermont? Vermont? Oh, we had some Vermonters uh, two weeks ago. Any, anybody else? Yes, sir. Michigan. Oh, we had a football coach used to work there. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he works there anymore, does he? Yeah. Delaware. Delaware. I'm sorry I didn't say Delaware. We have a lot of Delawareans here, too. Another place. Anybody from outside of the U.S.? California. South Carolina. California. Texas. Texas. Ooh. Utah. Utah, nice. You know, we joined the Big 12. We're not sure why we did that. <laughs> Those of you from Texas, um, well, welcome. See, the diversity that we have today just with all of you is what we have on our university campus, which is great for your incoming students. And we're so grateful that you entrust us to, to grant, to work with them so that they get their degree from this wonderful institution. But obviously I work in student conduct, uh, which means sometimes I deal with students that may have made a mistake. Did your children ever mess up in their lives? <laughs> ever screw up in any sort of way? No, <laughs> right? Um, so our process in our office is that we do address behavior on and off our campus, and we have a campus student code like every college and university does. So we work with local agencies, and you know, students sometimes will 
make a mistake off campus, get a citation of some sort, and we sit down and talk with them about that. For us, it's an educational process. It's all about behavioral change. Um, so as parents, you know, if a student gets an underage possession, let's just say, of alcohol, and maybe they get, they get one and that's all they ever get, we probably won't meet with them, but we may contact them. If they have a pattern of behavior that is probably causing them not to be as academically focused as they need to be, then we're probably going to have a conversation with them and impose some sanctions whereby we think they can maybe learn a little bit about what they're doing and how it's affecting them. So it's always a, an educationally based motivation behind us meeting with students. Um, and if you look on this slide, you'll see this Live Safe app that we now can download on our phones. It's a really nifty kind of safety tool where, as an example, if Sabrina and I are out and one of us decides to leave, we can tr one of us can track the other one on the way home. Um, if we have, we see some incident that occurs off campus and we want to alert police, uh, we can do that very quickly by, by hitting uh, the tip line or we can make an emergency 911 phone call from that application. Um, I've downloaded it to my phone, many of us have. My colleague actually downloaded it and his daughter downloaded it and he was able to watch her walk from home to some other place and knew that she'd made a stop off somewhere that she probably shouldn't have been so it's actually kind of a neat application and we're encouraging um, our students to use this while they're here when I first downloaded it my colleague Dave and I were doing it together and I, I hit the phone and it dialed the university police and then I got this call back. I went, ooh, it was an accident. <laughs> so we know it's working. Um, so I would encourage you to encourage your children to use that. This is just a little example of some of the uh, statistics that our office, we have a student conduct board process for students that really do some really terrible things, you know, whether it's being involved in fire-related incidents or something else. So the board does sometimes, unfortunately, expel or suspend students. That's absolutely not any goal of ours. Our goal is to keep students here and work with them from an educational perspective so that they do graduate from WVU. That's why they're here. Um, and this is, uh, you may have heard of Title IX um, in reference generally to athletics and women having equal access to competition in sport but it has a whole different aspect to it, which deals with sexual misconduct and sexual violence in higher education. Um, and as parents, we want you to know that we take those kind of incidents and those reports and complaints very seriously. And between our office and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, we do intense investigations. We take students to the Student Conduct Board if there's a complaint against them. So as parents, we want you to know that this is a very serious matter um, that like any other college or university in the US in particular, that's something that we will always follow up on and follow through with in terms of resolving the, the cases. Um, so I'm now gonna turn over to my colleague, Dave Durham, who's the Director of Career Services. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. <clears throat> Like Mel had to say, she's from downtown Pittsburgh, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, my name is Dave Durham, and I'm the director of the Career Services Center here at WVU, and I always get a few raised eyebrows when I'm first introduced as uh, from Career Services. For those of you that were in school a few years ago, uh, uh, college Career Services was a place you went in your senior year. Um, got a little help with your resume. If it was a pretty good center, they probably did some practice interviewing with you. But for the most part, y y it's a place you, you went and uh, got a little help with your resume and we sent you on your merry way to go look for a job. Uh, probably had a career fair or two. And, uh, uh, there, and that's why I really welcome the opportunity to speak to the parents of our incoming freshmen because today, Nothing could be further from the truth about what we do at Career Services and, and what students need to do with Career Services. Um, we do still have career fairs. While career fairs are sort of an old school practice, they're still very, very effective. If you think about it, it's an opportunity for me to get 100, 120 employers in one place at one time and get, allow our students to come through there and get some face-to-face -face real time with recruiters, even if it's 30 seconds or a minute or a couple of minutes. It's a great opportunity for them to get some face time. Um, 
We have a couple of fun programs we do around campus. We have our mocktail party and fashion show, which uh, is where we, we kind of introduce students to how to dress properly uh, uh, for interviewing and, and for work, uh, professional dress, also for behaving in, in a professional setting. You know, some of our students may be the very first time they go uh, uh, out for uh, drinks with the bosses and the boss is picking up the check. We don't want them to go you know, kind of go crazy and, uh, you know, don't order the 18-year-old scotch the first time you, your boss is paying it to pay, picking up the tab. Um, but what I really want to talk to you about today, and, and I have you guys for about 10 minutes. I've got your students for the next four years. So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of these things that have changed uh, in, in the way c companies recruit. Um, not only, not only has it changed how they recruit on campus, but also what they're looking for. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about that. As, as you're probably not surprised, but technology as it's impacted everything else has impacted the recruiting industry too. If you're in an HR job or you've applied for a job recently, you know that uh, most everything is done online today. Every company out there, from the, a small company to, to big multinational companies, use ATS system, they all applicant tracking systems, where the applicants uh, submit their resumes online or go online and complete an, uh, an application, an online application. And I, I can't begin to tell you what a disadvantage that is to an entry level student coming right out of school. You know, I, I kind of joke around and talk, tell people, you know, I, I have the, 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 the great advantage of being the grandson of a Baptist minister. You give me 30 minutes in a room with a recruiter, and when I'm done with them, they're going to want to hire me. If I'm not careful, they're going to want to take me home with them. <laughs> uh, but you don't get that opportunity today. In fact, some of the, uh, I have a keyword scan on, on here. Some of our big companies, like IBM, for example, worldwide will receive 30,000 resumes a month. Trust me, nobody's reading those. They're using optical character recognition software to scan them for keywords. So when we work with a, a student that's applying to a big company, we make sure that they go through, we go through the job description with them and pull out those keywords so that they're, they're in their resume, in their cover letter, in their application, or else they're not going to make it to the, to the next step. It's done with a computer, okay? Now, even here on campus, Career Services Center, we have our own applicant tracking system. We use a, a, a very robust online system called Mountaineer Track. Um, all of our students are registered in Mountaineer Track. Every single one of our students have a, an account. If the students that have, are alum that have graduated within the last six or seven years all have an account. If you're a WVU grad, I saw some of you raising your hands and you graduated a long 100 years ago like me, all you have to do is give our office a call and we'll put you right back in the system. Our services and programs are available to all of our graduates, all of our alums. As you can see, we have over 6,000 companies registered with us. And that, that group in any given year will post 5,000 or more jobs with us. And one of the reasons I, I like to, to, to kind of just bounce that number out there is because I want to make sure that you understand. How many of you are old enough to remember know who Paul Harvey is? Well, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. Um, we, like I said, we post over 5,000 jobs for our students every year. So I know a lot of what we hear in the, pr in the press is how difficult, I mean, who hasn't heard how hard it is for college graduates today to find a job? And, and you know what, the, there are some markets and the economy has impacted that, but I, I want you to know that what's more important than, because uh, the, the numbers, the statistic I hear that just really gets me is the one that says 53 or 51, whichever uh, survey you hear, 53% of the students who graduated from college last year reported that if they'd known then what they know now, they would have chosen a different major. Well, this is kind of harsh, but in my opinion, it wouldn't have made much difference. And I'll, and I'll tell you why I say that. We have 165 different degrees at WVU, different majors that you can major in at WVU. And I have successful students in every single one of them. So when we talk to students about choosing a major, we, we encourage them to choose a major about in, in something that they're interested in, something that, they, that they've got aptitude in, something they're passionate about. It, it doesn't really matter. Now, are there some majors that have more jobs than others? Of course there are. But it doesn't matter. We have successful students in every major. It's what you do to prepare yourself while you're here. The things other than just going to school and getting good grades. Okay, that's what's really critical. And that's what, that's what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about. So how, how, how big is a resume today 
if your the your first the first cut sometimes the second cut is going to be based on what that recruiter can glean from that resume and not even I don't even have the resume in front of me I've got an image of it on my computer screen okay put yourself in their place I've I've got a hundred resumes to read I guarantee you, tw after the first 20, whether you do it consciously or not, you're going to start looking for something to put it on the no pile more so than on the yes pile. So, so something on that resume's got to be, it's got to pop off the page. Something's got to interest me. I have recruiters say it. I hear them they say it to me all the time. Said, "Man, I read that, and I got to meet that student." And that's what we, that's what we're trying to do. So, if we don't do anything else at Career Services, we've got to help our students understand what they have to do to build a strong resume. A I've al I'm almost ready to come up with a new term because 21st century resume is 14 years old now. So I kind of need to come up with something new, but we've got to come up with something. So what are they looking for? We work with an, an organization called NACE, National Association of Colleges and Employers. They're nationwide. Basically what they do is, is th they survey students every year, but they also survey tens of thousands of employers, and they ask them, what is it you're looking for? In, in a, a fresh college graduate, you know, entry level uh, uh, position, what are you looking for in a, in, a, in a strong candidate? And up in all the years I've been in, I've been at WVU for a very, very long time, and up until just recently, the number one answer to that, the, of, if you list the top 10 things, number one was always academics, education, academics how smart you, you know, what you know. But, but it's, with, in light of the way that things have changed, it's no longer, the, the survey of 2012, 2013 was the first time ever it dropped from number one. It didn't drop to number two, it dropped to number five on the list. What do you think the number one thing is on the list? If employers are concerned about, want to see from a, a, a entry level candidate for a job. Communication skills. Communication skills, what else? Pardon me? Experience. Good group. What else? Teamwork, collaboration. Teamwork, collaboration. Le leadership, right? Very good. Let me bring these up here and we'll talk about them real quickly. Now, I do want to mention, with academics being at the bottom, and we are a university, so we, it's not exactly not important. But it's, it's, in fact, it's, it's what I call, it's the fundamental piece, the primary piece. For example, if I'm going to hire, if I need to hire a nurse, but think about it, I'm looking at a resume, right? So if I, I can't tell very much about how smart you are. There's only one thing on your resume that's gonna tell me anything, and that's your GPA. So if I say, okay, I need to hire a nurse, and I'm only gonna hire kids from, or interview students from an accredited program with uh, a 3.2 or higher, so I look at your resume, if you got a 3.3, you're on the yes pile. If you got a 3.1, you're on the no pile. It's, it's a checkbox. So while it's still critical, it's, it's the easiest of these things to determine. What I'm looking for in a student today is someone that I know can fit into the culture of my business, my company, my operation, someone that can communicate with others. And I have to I tell students all the time, this is a communication skill. I've never have a had a recruiter say, we're, we're going to give them a thumb speed test <laughs> and, and see who can text the quickest. No, it's impressive, but it doesn't look good, doesn't do much on a resume. So communication skills are critical. Can you work in groups? Um, experience, that was usually, usually it's the first one out of a parent's mouth if, because it's critical. So experience is, a, is probably the biggest thing that can, that can tip your hat, tip, your, tip, tip the scales in your favor on a resume. Uh, some of our majors lend themselves nicely to paid internships, not so much. The, there's volunteering though, there's shadowing. And, and the great thing about those other, you know, paid internship obviously is clearly the best opportunity because of the because of the the the, the, uh, um, the financial part of it. But when it comes time to put that experience on a resume, if if I'm an art history major that shadowed a museum curator one day a week, that's just as important to my resume as a chemical engineering major that had a you know twenty eight dollar an hour uh, paid internship with Dupont Chemicals. So, so there's, it doesn't matter. It's that you, there's experience. We've had, I've had employers say to us, say to a student before, when there's nothing on there, say the summer between their junior and senior year, and they'll, you know, 
were you abducted by aliens? Mm -hmm. what, what happened this whole summer? There's nothing on your resume. What did you do that summer? And they want to know that you're productive and that you're doing thing, constructive things with your time. Uh, leadership. Leadership has probably, if one of these, I have to say, has, it, has become more important in recent years, it's leadership. I, I tell folks all the time, it doesn't matter if I'm hiring someone to run my company or mow my grass. I want somebody that when I'm not there, they're going to do a good job. You know, this is kind of cliche, but of all these things that have changed over the last 20 years, one thing hasn't changed, and it's how we spell integrity. And I'm telling you folks, it's still very, very important, important to employers. It really is. They want to know that someone's got, that they've got a strong ethics, strong value, strong moral things. And those aren't things we necessarily pick up in the classroom. Those are things that they get from home and from their environment and from us while we're here, they're here. Engagement, someone mentioned this one too. This is huge. Um, they want to know you're involved. They want to know you're, that you're, you're going to be, that, you know, that, that you've, you've got some energy and you're going to do things. Uh, Katie and Sabrina mentioned the student organizations. We have hundreds of student organizations. We have leaders, offices in each one of them. Opportunities to become involved in the community, in the university community. It might be learning a second language. It might be a study abroad. It might be volunteerism. You know, if I'm hiring someone that's going to be working with the public or in some type of service, and you see someone that's got several hundred hours of volunteer hours on their resume, I already know here's a person that's willing to invest themselves, invest their time in something where the reward isn't just for them. They recognize the needs of others. That's critical. Now, so these are the components of, of a strong resume. What's, what's interesting in these, and this is what I want you to make sure you, you take home from this, is that while these things are all very, very different, they have one huge thing in common. They're all cumulative. Remember my example? I said 20 years ago you went to career services in your senior year. There's not a single thing on that list that I can fix in the last semester of your senior year if you haven't already started it. They all start now. My career counselors in our office call it, when we see a senior for the first time, they call it damage control. <laughs> we have to try to find something that they accidentally did that we can fit into one of these categories and try to beef up their resume a little bit. I mean, I mean, you know, like, like we, we kind of make a, 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 a joke out of it, but it's really, it's true. It all starts now. What we've done in our office to, to uh, uh, kind of react to these changes is we've developed a program called Greater Than a Four-Year Plan, and we've broken it down into, and, and this is all in the material you're going to get, so you don't need to try to read it here, but plan it, build it, work it, live it. We've taken all the things that you need to do and broken it into, it's almost freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, but not quite. Some are ahead, some maybe change majors, they're a little behind, but it doesn't matter. It, it, it gives you manageable achievable milestones along the way so you can sort of whittle away at it if you will as you go and not be just overcome by it all at one time at the end when it's just impossible to do now well I, and I feel v with the people we have in this program we have in place I feel very very confident that students that that, that really buy into this are going to be successful it gives them you know it's nothing magical that we're doing we're just kind of coaching them on what they need to do to, to, to do the right things to be what we call career ready when they graduate. Now, that's the good news. The bad, you know, good news, bad news, right? The bad news is not a single thing we do in our office is required. Your students could come in, go all through their four years or so, graduate and leave, and never write a resume, or never set foot in our office. So what I need you to do, is to raise your right hand and solemnly swear to nag your children. <laughs> Remember the FERPA slide? We're not FERPA protected. We don't, we don't do academic stuff necessarily. So seriously, this is an area where you can encourage your, your son and your daughter to, to, to get in here when they say, I don't know what to do about this, or I don't know what to do about that. Get them into our office. We'll help them. Okay? And one last thing, on your way out, and then I'm going to let Katie and Sabrina wrap this up. You'll see a little blue card. There's some down here and some in the back when you exit. And it says hire a mountaineer. One of the other things you can do to help WVU and to help your son and help your daughter, the employer you work for hires entry-level people. Put them in touch with our employer relations office. Okay, the information's on the card. So I'd appreciate it if you take one of those if you're in that position and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. So 
if you didn't take the nagging pledge, nudge the guy next to you and wake him back up because some of you look as tired as your students do at the last chapter of the semester, right? So as we rev back up here to kind of close things out, at the bottom of your sign-up sheet, we did give you your homework assignments. So if you can pull that back out, we're going to kind of highlight a few things for you on there. Um, these are kind of some things that we know have come up. Um, you have a lot of things coming at you during this summer semester, and we know that. But we want to highlight a few because we do feel that they're quite important to mention. You met our folks from our Office of Student Conduct today and also from our Office of Career Services. I like to mention that as we head into this alcohol EDU piece because it's quite important. The drinking age in West Virginia is what? And your students are? Not 21. Please have the conversation with them this summer. You don't want them to have to meet with Melanie Cook's office and student conduct, and also oftentimes those type of infractions will jeopardize what Dave can do with them on the other end. So keep that in mind. They are adults coming in. These are adult decisions that they're going to be making, and they need to definitely realize that as they come in, that great freedom. With that comes great responsibility. Please, please, please hit that home to your students this summer. We do have alcohol EDU, which is required of your students. I want to mention this briefly. They have part one that is due by the time they come to campus this, this fall. Part two is due by mid-semester point. They are fined if they don't complete these. Please remind them to do it. They will be getting plenty of emails to their mix account about this. I also want to mention for parents, there is also a section for parents. It's not required, but if you have an interest in it and you ha haven't had that conversation, this is a great place to kind of start that conversation. I had a parent tell me a couple years ago, my daughter didn't need it, but she had a roommate who ended up having some challenges, and I'm glad I went through it because it helped me to be able to have those conversations. So please do make sure that you educate yourselves about those. Academically speaking, we also keep an eye on areas where we know that students might stumble in the academic realm as well. We watch for our classes for incoming freshmen where they have high DFW rates. That's Ds, Fs, and withdrawals. And we reach out at week four in the semester. We have 16 week semesters here. They have 12 weeks at that point in time to kind of get back on track. At week four, if they're not doing well, we give them just an indicator of an I. It means that intervention is needed. And we know from places where they've had a lot of intervention in high school, that transition point can be kind of difficult. So our student success coaches actually reach out at week four to those students and say, you got to start tuning in. Maybe you need to get into the learning centers. Maybe you need to get in there and see the faculty members. Touch base with them and see what's going on. We do it again at week eight. I mentioned those grades at the parent portal level. Parent portal will be able to see grades at the mid-semester mark, only if there are Ds or Fs. So no news is good news at the mid-semester mark, OK? So keep that in mind. As they go through, though, we do read Realize. You heard Sabrina mention earlier, October is a long month. And we did realize that. We used to have a lot more judicial infractions in October. And academically, it's just you're kind of in the drudgery of the whole thing. So last year, we actually instituted a fall break. This year, we're doing the same thing. It's going to be on Monday and Tuesday, October 13th and 14th. <laughs> want to mention that to you as parents, because this is different in some senses. Um, we have had a lot of good success with it, though. Students tend to stay here during that fall break because the residence halls remain open open. You don't have to come and get them. And often it's a good chance for them to check in. What's working? What's not? Am I behind in reading in this class? Do I need to go and see my academic advisor? It's a great opportunity to kind of engage and check back in and get things back on course so they can have that successful first semester. You can see a lot of the other things that are ahead of them at that point as well. If they're thinking about dropping a class, maybe they came in thinking that they're going to be a CSI investigator because they've watched it on television for 12 years, and then they meet Chemistry 116, and maybe not going to be a CSI investigator anymore, right? So if they're thinking about changing majors, they need to log on to DegreeWorks, take a look at what that's going to look like to switch majors. How is that going to maybe put them behind, or do they need to pick up an extra class or drop that chemistry class if they're going to an area where it's not needed anymore? So a lot of decisions academic advising, etc. So please keep that in mind as they go through that process. That proactive versus reactive approach, quite important as well for you all as parents. During November is the first time that we will be closing the residence halls. We do it three times throughout the year. That would be for Thanksgiving break, winter break, and spring break. And we don't care where they go, but they can't stay here because we will be locking down the residence halls. So keep that in mind. Keep a couch, keep a cot, keep a place for them to stay because they're probably coming home for some of those times. But it is important that you know as well the 
the dates and times that those residence halls close, they're on page three of your handbook. So if you look at that, we do close some on Friday evenings. So please note that if you're the one making the reservations for them on a plane ride home, um, or if you're planning on coming and picking them up, because some of those are Friday evenings. Lots of different ways that we get our students to and from. When you mentioned, um, Sabrina mentioned about the sign up and giving us that email address, I send out those parent electronic newsletters twice a month. In September, I'll be sending out information about our Mountaineer Parents Club buses. These holiday buses do run at those three times when we close residence halls, and we'll be sending information out to you about signing up in September once we open up those reservations, and also about the myriad of other ways to get your students back and forth to campus. And the last part that we want to talk just a little bit about, because we know this happens at the end of the semester. Believe it or not, your students will begin thinking about where they're going to live next year. And I know that you're thinking, my gosh, we haven't even moved them in yet. And that's how quickly this process happens. We want to share with you and want you to know that your students can live in the residence halls, their sophomore years, their junior year, and their senior year. And it's important that you know that because more and more of our students are doing that. They're realizing it's a great deal. I just walk right downstairs to the cafeteria, great food, don't have to clean my bathroom, I don't know what utilities are. It's a great deal, but we ask our current students living in the residence halls to make that decision by about the end of January. So don't be surprised if they start talking to you about this over Thanksgiving and winter break. Know that we have lots of resources available for your students as they begin thinking about this process. We have a student advocate. Kim Mosby is a wealth of information, not just about on and off campus housing, but can certainly be useful in these situations. Our off campus housing website, explore the websites. What's rent in Morgantown? Is it a lot more than you thought? Not nearly as much as you had planned on or had budgeted for and encourage your students to go to our off-campus housing fair that's held annually. We don't want to see your student fall into that trap of if you don't sign a lease today it's probably the last apartment. Probably not true. I also want to remind you in case you didn't know that in West Virginia you only have to be 18 years old to sign a lease. A legally binding contract. It's a little scary I think. Think about about that for a minute, parents. Do your students know what joint and several liability is? Do they know that uh, when they sign the lease, the first month's rent, the last month's rent, and the security deposit are all due at the time they sign the lease? So know this, we have student legal services available for your students. We have student attorneys for free. I apologize any attorneys in the room, but we have student attorneys for free for our students. And many times during this point in the year, they are reviewing leases. They're reading that fine print and they're pointing out to your students. For example, were you planning on bringing a car and parking at your apartment? Yes. Well, did you know that parking wasn't included? It's an extra expense. Those are those types of things that we can help navigate with your students. And we like to share this with you because once we had a parent sign a lease for their student to live on campus and their student signed a lease to live off campus. Those were two legally binding contracts that they were responsible for. So we want to make sure that you're prepared for those conversations. And just as Katie promised at the beginning, you, we still have two minutes. I'm sure your students are just fine, believe me. Even though some of you, I always look at Katie and say, oh, they just rushed out with their phone. I know who that is. Just a couple reminders. Know that we're available after class if you have any questions. Katie also mentioned that this is being taped. So after our last orientation session, you can go to the Mountaineer Parents Club website if for whatever reason you would like to review any of this today. Also, we encourage you to join the Parents Club and you can leave the signups in the back of the room or the front of the room as you exit. If you choose to exit through this door, it just takes you to a ramp right up top. Also, on the bottom of your syllabus, is an evaluation link. Please take a few minutes to complete that about new student orientation. It's not just about this session, it's about new student orientation, so please complete that. And lastly, 
Please be sure to remind your students to finalize their schedules today, okay? After this class and you meet up with them, if they hold that schedule up and say, I have no idea why I have this class, or I have no idea why I have this many hours, don't you go back in, but turn your students around and have them go back in. Because truly, we do this every day. So if they get home tomorrow and decide, I'm just going to call my academic advisor and straighten this whole thing out, guess what? Their academic advisor is going to be doing this. So so students need to take advantage of them today and parents please take advantage of all of the units and departments and resources that are available to you after this at the information fair in the Mountain Lair. Thank you and welcome parents of our newest Mountaineers.